The story is told of a man who was driving down the highway at a very high rate of speed. He was speeding. He was breaking the law. And as a result of that, he was pulled over by a police officer. The police officer walked up to the car and asked the gentleman, he said, Sir, may I have your driver's license? And the man said, I don't have one. He said, Well, sir, do you have your registration? And he goes, No, sir, I don't have any registration. He said, Sir, is this your car? No, I, I stole it from a, a little old lady. And he said, Excuse me? He said, in fact, I've got a gun in my glove compartment right now. He said, you've got a gun? And he said, yes, I do. That's what I used to kill the little old lady when I stole her car, and her body's in the trunk right now. The police officer, trying to keep his composure, radioed in for his supervisor and a group of backup to come and to assist him in this situation. When his supervisor showed up on scene, he walked up to the car very cautiously and he said to the man, sir, do you have any identification? He said, yes, sir, here's my driver's license and my registration. He said, excuse me? And the sir said, yes, this is my driver's license and this is my registration. He said, sir, uh, do you have a gun in the car? He goes, no, officer, I do not. Sir, is this your car? Absolutely, you can see that from the registration. He said, sir, I have to ask, do you have the body of another individual in your trunk? And he said, absolutely not. Let me show you. And he went to the back. He opened up the trunk, and there was nothing there. He said, sir, I don't understand what the problem is here. This other officer said that you had no identification, that you had stolen this car, that you had taken a gun and shot a woman and stored her body in your trunk. Why in the world would he say that? And the driver said, sir, I, I have no idea why in the world he would say something like that. Next thing you know, he's probably going to say that I was speeding, too. That's a good story. And it's a good story about how we live in a day and age where people don't seem to want to take responsibility for their actions. It did not take me any time at all to go on to Google and just Google a few images to make a point. Now, trust me, this is not political, but it proves a point of the environment in which we live. It didn't take me any time at all to find pictures of Trump where people say, I blame him for all of the world's woes. And just in case you're thinking I'm picking sides, it didn't take me any time at all to find pictures of people who blamed Obama for what he did. And by the way, even Obama himself evidently blamed his wife, Michelle. But when I look at all of these, I see even Uncle Sam blames us for some of the problems. Government sometimes comes along and says it's our fault rather than their fault in things that they might do wrong or in areas where they may have poor judgment. In fact, considering the current situation, where we are in regarding the coronavirus. I found this one where this particular news organization was asking, is Trump blaming China for COVID-19? You decide. On the other hand, China is currently blaming us, suggesting that we started the viral outbreak, and perhaps it even had something to do with our military going and sowing the seeds of this virus in their country. There are even t-shirts, and if you'll recognize, and I realize that this might be hard to, to see, but these are actually infant or toddler shirts where we're already raising a generation to, to blame one another. One of those shirts says, uh, he did it, and another one of those shirts said, she did it. And so you see that we're raising a generation to not take responsibility for our actions. I even found this particular graphic, and I realize that you can't see it, but if any of you want to contact me, I'd be happy to show it to you. But it's real interesting. If you look up here, it says somebody's fault tree. And over here you have your fault. And then over here you have their fault. And then in the middle, not my fault. And I think that that middle position, or maybe the position to the far right, their fault is the position that we seem to want to fall back to so many times. We seem to go to those areas where we're blaming someone else 
but certainly not ourselves. And I want you to consider a passage of Scripture from uh, the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, where John wrote the following. He said, If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want you to pay very special attention to that word confess. Right in the middle of, of the passage, if we confess our sins. That word confess literally means to acknowledge or to own up to. In other words, it's taking responsibility for one's actions. If I sin and I do sin, and I try to blame somebody else that I'm not confessing my sin. I'm certainly not owning up to what I've done. I'm trying to pass the buck or kick the can down the road or put it on to someone or something else. And brethren, this seems to be a problem that we find in our world today. We seem to be surrounded by the blame game. Everything from government down to local organizations in our day-to-day -day relationships, not just with the world but with one another, even our relationship with God, we seem to want to pass blame in certain situations. And perhaps in much more situations, much, or many more situations, than it should be necessary for us to do. So this morning... I've entitled our lesson, Very Simply, Very Clearly, Stop Blaming Everybody Else. Because certainly, this is what we are surrounded with, and this is the influence that is in our world today. It's the example that's being set for us on all fronts, from parents to employers to employees uh, to teachers to students, uh, even in law enforcement and in our government situations, much less the church itself. We are surrounded by this failure to accept responsibility for one's own actions. And so this morning, I want us to make that herald cry, stop blaming everybody else. There are two points that we want to remember when things go wrong, and things do go wrong. Whether these are things in our world or whether these are matters of sin, things do go wrong. And so we're not suggesting that everything is perfect, but how should we act or react when these things do go wrong? Well, first and foremost, let's recognize that sometimes bad things happen and no one is to blame. I am not a conspiracy theorist. Regarding the current virus, I don't know that there was some mad scientist in some foreign country who dreamed up the coronavirus so that we could somehow uh, make uh, ourselves... Uh, make our enemies fewer or something to that effect. Uh, I don't believe that kind of thing. I believe this virus, like other viruses in the past, other viruses that have had far more, uh, more broadly reaching consequences than this one has had so far, I believe that those are a, a part of the world in which we live in, a part of the world that is suffering consequences from the sin that was introduced to our world so many years ago. But these are things that happen. A number of years ago when I lived in Missouri, I, was, uh, I lived in southwest Missouri not too far from Joplin when an F5 tornado came and, and hit the Joplin area and created terrible devastation. I'm not blaming anyone for that. That was not the government's fault. That was not some organization's fault. It was not even God's fault. Uh, we see these kinds of natural disasters happen all the time. I did not live here in Florida at this time, but it is my understanding that a number of years ago, I believe it was around 2004, 2005, there was not one, not two, but three hurricanes that crossed right over the central part of Florida where I live right now in a matter of two weeks. That was not anybody's fault. Sometimes bad things happen and no one is to blame. Let me give you an example of some of those things that I'm talking about. There's a great story for us in John chapter 9, and I would appreciate you turning in your Bibles to John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. This is the story of a blind man, a person who was blind from birth. So this was not a, a con, this was not a trick. Here was a man who was truly blind. We read that as he, in verse 1, passed by, that's talking about Jesus, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, 
this man or his parents that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, I want you to consider that passage of Scripture because there were people in Jesus' day who believed somewhat like some people believe today, that if something bad happens, it must be somebody's fault. It must be because they did something wrong. It must be because uh, they sinned in some way. If somebody's loved one passes away, then somebody says, well, they must have done something wrong for God to take it out on them like that. Maybe if somebody's in a car accident, the question is raised, well, what have you done to get God mad at you? Or what have you done to deserve such a situation? When I was in a car accident a few years ago, uh, I didn't do anything wrong. I happened to be turning at a light when somebody else ran a red light and hit me and, and caused the car to be damaged and my arm to be broken. Now, I can truly say that maybe there was an issue of law, but I don't think that anybody had it out for me. I don't think somebody was planning that day to, to T-bone me and, and cause that kind of hurt and, and that kind of uh, uh, harm. But that's sometimes what we do today. We immediately get out of our cars and go, what did you do? Why did you do that? This is your fault. And, and we just immediately start putting blame on other people sometimes when that blame is not worthy to be given. There's a passage in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20 that teaches us that, yes, sin is serious, but sin is not something we inherited. The, the blind man did not inherit sin from his parents, and therefore was he born blind because of its parents' sin. Ezekiel writes in 18 and verse 20, the person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. You see, when a person sins or disobeys God, he is going to be held accountable for his sin. But that sin is not going to be passed down through the generations. Adam and Eve introduced sin into our world when they were the first ones to sin. But I don't inherit their sin. It is true that all of us may deal with the consequences of the previous generation sin. For instance, if someone is drinking alcohol when they are with child and that child is born with fetal alcohol syndrome, or maybe they're taking some other kind of drug and that child is born with some type of physical or mental defect, yes, we deal with the consequences, but the sin itself is not passed down. And the sin itself is not always the cause of something that has happened to another. We bear the burden of our own guilt. We pay the price for our own sin. If you go back in the Old Testament, there's a great story about Job in Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 22. Now, in this story, obviously, we could say that the devil was to blame because the devil was behind all of the bad things that happened to Job. In Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 13 and reading down through verse 22, we read the following. Now, on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking in the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, and they died, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Now, in this particular case, if you read the prior segment, Satan actually approached God. And because Job's faith was so great and was so strong, God said, if you feel like you can get anywhere with my servant Job, you go right ahead and do it. And the devil took him up on the challenge. So the devil is behind this. The devil is behind all of Job's livestock going away, all of his servants being slain all of his children being killed. And we read in verse 20, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. 
He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, he probably could have accurately and correctly blamed Satan, but Job doesn't blame anyone. He realizes that everything that he had was a gift from God, and if God chose in some way to take it away, he certainly wasn't going to blame God, but in fact, he fell down and worshiped God, and he gave him praise and thanksgiving for what he had been given. I was watching the news just a couple of days ago, and somebody was asking a fellow of a religious background, he says, what do you say to all of these people who blame God for the current circumstances in which we find ourselves? What do you say about those people who say the coronavirus is a sign of the coming of the end of times and beware because everything's about to, to be over? And he said, well, first of all, we don't blame God for evil because God doesn't do evil. But he said, for those people who want to blame God during bad times, to be consistent, they need to thank God during good times. And in truth, how many of us are mindful of thanking God for all the blessings we have even in the midst of these bad times? That's what Job did. Job blamed no one, and he certainly didn't blame God. This was a part of life. And even if the devil had not been directly behind these things, accidents happen. People die. Livestock or animal or property sometimes is lost. But will we thank God, even in the difficult times, for all that he's done for us and continues to do for us, or will we play the blame game? Remember, sometimes bad things happen, and no one is to blame. But God is always there and is worthy of our thanks. Let's take a look at another point to remember when things go wrong. And that is sometimes bad things happen and no one else is to blame. Now please notice that statement, that no one else is to blame. No one else other than me. No one else other than you. Because a lot of times when bad things happen, they happen because we've chosen to allow those things to happen. We've chosen to bring those circumstances into our lives. The Bible teaches us bad company corrupts good morals. So in other words, if you hang out with bad people, you're probably going to do bad things. And if you do bad things, you're probably going to get in trouble for it. Don't blame anybody else for that. Don't blame other people for what you've done. Recognize and accept responsibility for ourselves. There was a situation not too long ago that I know of where somebody had done something wrong. They had done something terribly wrong. It was, it was sinfully wrong. And one of the first things out of their mouths was, well, let me explain to you why I did that. There is no explanation for sin. There is no justification for wrongdoing. There is never an okay time or an okay circumstance when I can transgress or go against the will of God. But we live in a day and age where even our sins seem to be easily excused. Even our, our criminals will show up in a court of law and say, it wasn't my fault, it was somebody else's fault, or I wasn't treated right, or something. And so it's always somebody else's fault. In fact, some people say that our prison system is filled with more innocent people than anywhere on the face of the planet. And we're not talking about people wrongly accused, we're talking about how many people in those prison systems all claim that they did nothing. That's what we're surrounded with. That's the influence that we have in our lives. And the question is, sometimes when I do something wrong, I need to own up to that and not pass the responsibility on to others like several people did in Scripture. I'll give you an example. We don't have to go but three chapters into the beginning of the very first book of the Bible before you have people passing blame. God had told Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, he had told them as they were living in the Garden of Eden, this literal paradise on earth, he had told both of them, he said, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But they did. They ate the forbidden fruit. And when God comes up and approaches them, and they have now covered their nakedness with fig leaves to, to, to try to hide themselves from uh, the circumstances in which they found themselves, Okay, 
God comes up to them and says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I have commanded you not to eat? The answer to that, the right answer, the proper answer is yes. We did it. But starting with the head of the home, Adam said, the woman. He immediately is blaming the woman, but I want you to notice something else he says. The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Do you notice not only one blame, but two. He's not only blaming Eve for what he chose to do. He even blames God for the woman that he gave him. As if maybe God didn't create her right. Maybe she was broken from the beginning. Maybe she was just going to be a bad influence all along. And somehow that was God's fault. God turns to the woman and says, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Literally for the first time in human history, somebody said, the devil made me do it. I remember the times growing, uh, when we were raising our oldest two boys. And I remember the times when they would run up to me and uh, John would say, Michael made me, do, or made me mad. Or Michael would say, John made me mad. And we'd sit them both down and we'd say, guys, no one can make you mad. No one can make you do anything. Uh, you're allowing them to have some kind of control or influence over you. But if you're going to get mad, you need to take responsibility for that. If you're going to say something that is not nice, you're going to have to, exp exp to own the consequences of your actions. If you break the law, you're going to have to do, be the one to pay the time for the crime. But we have to not be like Adam and Eve and pass the buck. We certainly don't want to be like Aaron who did the same thing in Exodus chapter 32, verses 21 through 24. You might remember in Exodus 32 that Moses had gone up on Mount Sinai and he was with God and he was gone for so long that the people started to wonder if he was ever going to come back down. Maybe something's happened to him. And so just as quickly as the God of the universe brings all of the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery to freedom, they just as quickly turn on God and they say to Aaron, Aaron, make for us a God. In other words, they're requesting that he make a, an idol or some kind of image that they can fall down and worship as if that false god were a true god. So we read when Moses shows up on the scene because Aaron has collected all of their gold and he's melted it down and he's created this golden calf. When Moses arrives on the scene in verse 21 of chapter 32, Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself that they are prone to evil. Now, when I read this, this verse right here, it reminds me of things that I hear sometimes when somebody says, Oh, no, 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 no. Don't be bad. It's not what it looks like. It's not what you think. You know, there are people who are caught in terrible situations, and the first thing they say is, oh, it's not what it looks. Well, it looks pretty bad. It looks pretty wrong. It looks like sin. What else is it? Aaron continues to explain to justify what's going on. He says, first and foremost, you know the people. They're prone to doing things wrong. As for me, let me explain my part in all of this. They said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. You know, for a moment there, it almost sounds like Aaron's about to tell the truth. He said, after all, I, I did say to the people, uh, give me your gold, and, and I did throw it into the fire to be melted down. But then he acts as if some kind of miracle occurs because suddenly out comes this calf. And clearly uh, that must be a sign from above. Clearly that must be a sign that somebody gives approval to what we're doing because all I did, I was in fact, I was trying to teach them a lesson that if I just threw their, their gold into the fire, it would probably just uh, melt away and they'd lose it. Maybe they'd learn their lesson. But Moses, this calf jumped out and so I am without fault. Sometimes bad things happen, and we have no one but ourselves to blame. 
Aaron should have been stronger. Aaron knew better, but he gave in to the pressures of the people, and he made the decision to lead the people into idolatry on that occasion. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is a passage of Scripture you may not be as familiar with as Adam and Eve or Moses and Aaron. But this is a story about King Saul. He was the first king of Israel. He was a man that had started off doing so well. He was a humble man. Uh, he was a man that really didn't even want the position. But as he grew and over the years that he served, he started perhaps to think more highly of himself than he ought to. And as a result, uh, as his armies would be sent out to defeat foreign people, foreign peoples, uh, Saul on one occasion was told that he needed to destroy, utterly destroy the Amalekites and all of their possessions, even their livestock. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verses 9 and following, we read that Saul and the people spared Agag, that was the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep. So yes, they did destroy a lot of the livestock, but the best they saved for themselves violating the instructions that had been given to him and to the people by God. They kept the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, and, and it was told Samuel saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the command of the Lord. No, you didn't. But he's, you can imagine he's puffing up his chest and he's saying, I've done everything you've told me to do. Remember something, you can fool some of the people some of the time, all of the people all of the time. You'll never fool God any of the time. Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? In other words, if you killed everything, if you utterly destroyed everything as God commanded you to, why am I hearing livestock in the background? Why am I hearing these animal sounds going on? Dead animals don't make sounds. Why am I hearing this? Listen to Saul's answer. In verse 15, Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. That wasn't in the discussion. They kept the best for themselves because they wanted the best. The things that they didn't want, they followed God's will and they utterly destroyed it but only because they didn't want it, because it wasn't good, because it wasn't the best. And so when Samuel confronts Saul, Saul, once again, it's, it's kind of like Aaron. Hey, 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 don't worry about it. This isn't exactly what you're thinking. Let me explain to you what we did. We had a better idea. The people decided, you know, what we should do is keep the best and we'll give it as a sacrifice to God. I doubt very seriously that conversation ever took place. I doubt very seriously that was in fact what was going on, especially after Saul erects a monument to himself. I don't think that they're thinking about God. I think that they're thinking about themselves. When Samuel approached Saul and said, what have you done? Saul should have said, I didn't follow the instructions. I didn't follow what I was told to do. I didn't do the things I was commanded. I'm sorry. I repent. Please give me another chance. I'll do better. But instead, he tries to pass the buck. He tries to play that blame game. And as a result, ultimately, the kingdom is taken away from Saul. I want you to consider something. I want you to consider two additional points. As I was standing outside talking to my neighbor yesterday, he asked me the question, uh, about how to fi find us on YouTube or Facebook, and I helped him to do that. And we were talking about people in our society, and yes, politics came up, and we were talking about how people blame one another. And when he brought that up, I said, that, that indeed has a lot to do with my lesson tomorrow. Now, today is Easter Sunday. 
a holiday that many people observe. And although the Bible does not tell us to observe a, a, a particular Sunday out of the year regarding the resurrection of Christ, rather it teaches us to do what we're going to do in a little bit to remember the, the death of Jesus on the cross every first day of the week. We realize that to many this is a religious holiday and they think about the resurrection. And so when I don't have a lesson specifically on the resurrection of Christ, people think that's kind of strange. And when I talk about something like are we blaming others for things that we are going to be held accountable for, people think that on this particular Sunday of the year that's kind of a strange thing. But give me a second and let me see if I can't tie a little bit of that in as well just for those who are looking on a, about a lesson on the resurrection. First and foremost, let's remember this first additional point. When Jesus died on the cross, he did nothing wrong to condemn. In other words, he was not blameworthy. He didn't do anything wrong. Now remember something. He was crucified between two criminals. And one of those criminals, both of them are hurling insults and making fun of Jesus in the beginning. But one of them has a change of heart. And he, in fact, actually looks over at the other criminal and he says, you know, what you and I did, we deserve to be here. He actually owned what he had done. We did the crime, we're doing the time. And in fact, in this case, we are paying the ultimate price because it, our lives are going to end this day. We did wrong. But this guy, he didn't do anything. He didn't do that. In fact, a Roman guard would say later, he said, certainly this man was innocent. Pilate, who tried him prior to his crucifixion, couldn't find anything wrong with him. His wife even warned him and said, I've had a dream about this guy. Don't send him to the cross. He's innocent. Jesus never did anything wrong. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 reads, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus knew no sin. He never did anything wrong. But he became sin for us. In other words, our sins were put upon him so that we might have the hope of eternal life. Peter would write in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. You know what we learned there? When Jesus died on the cross, he did so not because he did anything wrong, not because he deserved it, not because he was at fault, but because we were. We're the ones who should be on that cross. We're the ones who are at fault. We are the ones worthy of blame because we are the ones who have sinned. But Jesus loved us, and although he had done absolutely nothing wrong, he was not worthy to be condemned for anything. He loved us so much that he gave his life up for us. Now, there were a lot of people who died on crosses that day and the days before and the days after. This was a, a favorite way of punishing people under the Roman Empire. But I want you to consider something else. I want you to consider that resurrection for just a moment. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, we did nothing right for him to commend. We did nothing right to deserve such a gift. In fact, indeed, it is a gracious gift indeed because we are getting something we do not deserve, but it is also a merciful gift because we're not getting what, we're not getting what we do deserve. I want you to consider what Peter continues to say in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
Do you realize that we spend a lot of our time focusing on the crucifixion of Jesus, and, and justly so? We should do that. In a minute, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're going to partake of that unleavened bread and that fruit of the vine, which represents the crucified body of Jesus and the blood that flowed down his body from the wounds in his flesh. We're going to do that in remembrance of him. We're going to remember the crucifixion, but don't forget the resurrection. And please, don't forget the resurrection the next 364 days of the year. It is good that you remember the resurrection today. But remember the resurrection every day because that's the key to all of it. Because whereas many men have died, whereas many men have died on a cross, only one rose from the dead. Only one walked out of that tomb. And brethren, we didn't deserve for that to happen. We did not deserve the grace and mercy that is afforded us, the hope that is given to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21 and 22 talks about baptism, and it's comparing baptism to Noah and the flood. The same water that destroyed the world saved Noah and his family. And the same water today that will destroy those who do not obey the will of the Father can save those of us who do. Not because we deserve it. Not because we've done so much good that we have any right to ever go up to God and say, you owe me heaven. Not at all. I heard somebody say very sadly, not too long ago, that they've never heard grace preached in the church. Well, I've never known that to be the case. And I've certainly never tried to let that be the case when I'm standing behind the pulpit. But just in case that person is accurate in her assessment of her upbringing, let me say this, how sad indeed. Because brethren, without the grace of God, without his mercy, we are lost indeed. There is no way that we can find salvation and eternal life without the precious grace and mercy of Jesus. And Peter says on that occasion to this gift that we have been afforded to be washed in the blood of the Lamb, to come in contact with the precious blood of Jesus, to go down into the waters of baptism lost and come up out of the waters of baptism saved. In 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22, corresponding to the flood, corresponding to those waters that divided the lost from the saved, he says corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. But listen to what he says. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Do you know what that's saying? That's saying because of the gospel, because of the good news of Jesus, because of not only his death and his burial, but his resurrection, we who live in sin can die to that sin, be buried in the waters of baptism, and rise to walk in newness of life. We can be born again not of flesh, but of the Spirit, when we follow the will of God and we come in contact with that cleansing blood. Paul would say to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions or our sins, even when we were dead and should have just been spiritually left in the tomb, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Indeed, Jesus rose from the tomb so that we could rise from the death of sin and so that we could have eternal life one day. We are indeed blessed by the gift of God. But let's remember what we're talking about and that's not blaming other people. When I walked out of the house this morning my daughter said something that was actually an old reference to happy days. If you ever watched that television show in the 70s and 80s a nice primetime comedy about a family in, in earlier times and in simpler times and 
there was a particular character. And I looked at my daughter and I said to her as I got into the car, I said, we'll be paying attention this morning uh, while we're live streaming. I said, because Fonzie is going to make the lesson. Some of you may remember the character of Arthur Fonzarelli, also known as the Fonz. He was the guy who would walk around with his thumbs up like this and go, hey, and for years people would do that and they'd wear t-shirts with him holding his thumb up and and in fact this became so much of a of an icon in our society that when things are going good we give the thumbs up he didn't author that necessarily but it became very popular as a result of him and if you notice from the slide behind me the Fonz is saying something like I was rrr. I was rrr. I was rrr. And if any of you ever watched the television show, you'll remember that this is in reference to the Fonz's inability to ever admit he was wrong. He would try to get the words out. He would, he would labor over them for a while until somebody said, okay, Fonz, I get it. I understand what you're talking about. I, I, and then he'd stop. But he found it very difficult to own up to anything that he had done that might be wrong. And I wonder if we have the same problem today, because I think we do. I think too often times we let pride get in the way. Too often we're building monuments to ourselves, and we're thinking that maybe we are so good and so great, maybe even as children of God, that we're just so blessed that we can do no wrong. Remember what John says, don't say that you're without sin. Even children of God, we make mistakes. Even children of God, we are wrong. Even children of God sin. The key is, what kind of children of God are we? Are we unfaithful children who have a difficult time owning up to what we've done, who have a difficult time saying we're wrong? Or are we faithful children of God who when we realize we have done wrong, we are quick to make things right with God. We are quick to make things right with others if we have harmed them or led them astray in any particular way. I want you to remember the attitude of the prodigal son because if there's any attitude we should have, it's this one. It's the attitude that says when we do wrong, we simply want to make things right. You remember the story of the prodigal son from Luke chapter 15? This was a, a younger son who did not stay on the farm, did not continue to work with his father and his older brother. In fact, he asked for his inheritance and he, and he left with all that money to a far off land where the Bible says he wasted it in riotous living. He partied. I'm sure he had lots of friends when he was partying and he had money to spend on them. But as soon as the money dried up, so did the friendships and suddenly he finds himself feeding pigs. It's in that moment of time that we read in verses 17 through 19 that the prodigal son, when he came to his senses, do you realize that blaming others, blaming uh, friends for your mistakes, blaming family for your mistakes, blaming God for your mistakes is not sensible? It is senseless. But when the prodigal son came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. What an amazing statement. The very first thing out of his mouth, Father, I have sinned. I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. This is the prodigal son saying, All sin is an affront to God. All sin goes against God. That's the definition of sin. When we transgress or go against the law of God. The very first thing he says is, I've sinned against heaven. I have done what is morally wrong in the eyes of my creator, and I own it. I accept it. I, I realize that that is my fault. Nobody else's. I chose this course of action. I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. I've sinned in your sight. And this is his way of not only acknowledging, but begging for repentance from God in heaven above and from his own earthly father. And of course, the father in this story is compared to our heavenly father in heaven. We realize that whenever we sin, whether it be public or private, we sin against God. But if there is someone in our lives, in our world, that we sin against or we've set a bad example for, 
then we go to those people and we make it right as well. And I want you to notice the attitude not of arrogance by being the child of the father. I want you to notice the attitude of humility that the prodigal son gives to his father when he says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. What I did was wrong. What I did deserves nothing but punishment. And I realize that I may have been born your son, but my actions are not deserving for me to continue as your son. So please, simply make me as one of your hired servants. Never call me son again. Treat me as nothing better than an employee. That's all I ask, just so that I can be with you, just so that I can once again be a part of your home. What a great prayer for us to pray today when we do wrong. Not the prayer that says, boy, God, I'm glad I'm not like this guy. Boy, God, I'm glad I'm not like that lady over there. Boy, God, I, I'm glad that you made me so great and you made everybody else with all their faults so that they can look to me to, to figure out how to live life. Because I don't ever do anything wrong, but I certainly see them doing things wrong. In fact, some of the things that some people might blame me, it's really their fault. No. We ought to have the attitude of the prodigal son who says, I'm sorry. I'm willing to change. I'm not asking for anything except your grace and except your mercy that I not be cast out of your presence forever. What a great prayer. We always talk about the prodigal son as the kid who runs off and the kid who wastes time, wastes money, wastes relationships. But you know what? There's few responses to sin that's better than that. He didn't blame anybody. He didn't blame his father for giving him the money. He didn't blame his older brother for being oppressive and, and, and being the older brother, having rights to things that he wouldn't have. He, he didn't blame the world around him. He didn't blame his circumstances. Well, I was born rich, so therefore I didn't know better. Or maybe as some people might say, well, I, w I was born poor, so I've never had a chance. Brethren, it doesn't matter whether you're male, female, old, young, rich or poor, black or white. It is immaterial when it comes to your spiritual relationship with God it is completely and totally in your hands. The gift that he extends to you, his grace, his mercy, the blood of his son on that cross, he extends to you because you deserve nothing, but he's still willing to give you his love. And as such, realize who we are. We are sinners, and we're sinners in need of salvation. And we're never going to come to that salvation if we're constantly pointing fingers at other people, if we're constantly blaming others, if we're constantly passing the buck and finding the fault in others without owning up to the fault that's within ourselves. Brethren, let's this morning make the decision to confess our sins, to own up to what we've done. If you're outside of Christ this morning, repent of your sins. Confess the name of Jesus and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. I realize that so many of you are at home, but brethren, we can take care of that. We can find a body of water near you, and we can immerse you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Maybe you are a child of God, and I expect that many who are watching this broadcast this morning are. The question is this. Please get rid of the pride. Please get rid of the selfishness. Please get rid of the haughtiness. Humble yourselves, realizing that we are sinners saved by the grace of God. And if you have something in your life that's not right, acknowledge it. Own it. Go to God in prayer and ask Him for forgiveness. And then with a penitent heart, change the way that you're living. Change the things that you're doing that are not in harmony with His will. And start to walk in His steps. If we can pray with you or for you, what's interesting about what we have here is we have both on YouTube and Facebook a place to make comments. If you need prayers, we'll pray for you. Just let us know. If you want to do that on a more private level, contact us by telephone or by email or by text and, and let us know how we can pray with you and for you. We want to do that because we want to recognize who it is that has saved us 
from what we've done. So brethren, don't blame others. Blame yourself for sin and look to God for salvation on his terms with the greatest of humility of heart. While together we sing this song of invitation.